Hello and welcome. This is the Start Harp webinar by Shelley Fairplay and it's called Be True to Your Harp. This first playthrough is going out live in 2019 in January and I welcome everyone here who has come. Thank you very much for attending live. So those of you who are here live, we've got Caroline, welcome, Carolyn, Cherry, Jill, Ivan, Joanne, Karen, Karen, Kate, Lorraine, Lorraine, Margie, Marianne, Peggy, Philonori, I think I may have said that wrong, apologies if I have, Richard, Sandra and Susan. So there are many names there that are familiar to me and there are also some names there that I am excited to hopefully get to know. So thank you very much for coming. If you're watching the replay, then welcome to. I do hope you're going to enjoy this. I'm excited to share with you some of the thoughts that I've been having and some of the thoughts I'd like to share with you. My name is Shelley Fairplay. I've been teaching for, I've just been working that out about over, well, over 20 years now. And my online course is launched in 2016. I'm, I'm deeply passionate. I think my biggest passion of all really is just sharing the harp and um, really encouraging as many other people who want to play to play as possible. Um, I have harp ensembles, two harp ensembles, dynamic harps. Well, actually, it's three now. Um, three harp ensembles, and we meet, we play together. We're 20 strong at the moment. So that's always great fun. I love to teach hands on harps workshops. I love to do schools workshops. I love to just get people involved with the harp and try and share my passion because I just love this instrument. I fell in love with it when I was only three years old, apparently, and then um, began my learning journey when I was about nine years old. And it's, it's just a lifelong passion. And I just want to help as many other people enjoy it really as I can. So this webinar is all about being true to your harp. And so I, you know, there's several things I really want to talk about tonight. And I also want to do some teaching as well to give you some more tips. So I'm going to try and not spend too much time talking. I get very keen if I get too deep into this, when I, I'll get keen on telling, talking to you about it. But I guess by be true to your harp, what I'm really getting at is well, it's nice to, there's that thing of New Year's resolutions or, you know, new terms resolution, or you might just feel that, you know, now's the time that you want to do something to really further your heart playing. But what is it going to mean to you to be actually true to your instrument? And what I'm getting at about that really is why do you want to play? And how are you going to make that happen? So those are the two things. So, you know, to be true to your desires is of, of expanding your playing and playing in a way that you would like to. You kind of really need to work on certain things, I think, to help you do that. And those are some of the ideas I'm going to share with you. So why do you want to play? Those of you who are, here, who are here live, if you're willing to share some of your ideas as to why you want to play the harp, then would you maybe share them and type them in the chat window? I know you can't all see each other's chat tonight, but I will read them out. So for the benefit of those of you who are watching the replay as well. So here are some things just to get you going and you can type in your own personal reasons if you'd like to hear. But some people want to play concerts. Um, I meet a lot of people who want to do things like do storytelling for their and children. I had one of my students who used to come to me for, in particular, we used to really focus, she moved away sadly, I love teaching her, but she wanted to be able to have special evenings with her family, so they used to, she used to practice, we'd work on songs for her to have sing-alongs with her family, which was really great fun. You might want to learn a really specific piece. You know, sometimes I meet people who say to me, I just want to be able to play Claire de Lune or something on the harp, and so that might be your big drive, might be a particular piece of music. Lots of people are quite interested in therapy harp and being able to play for loved ones or being able to go into care home settings and things like that. Um, but and those are all quite sort of specific and have a, a sort of a real obvious goal. But I also think that there are a lot of us and I really fell into this category for most of my playing life um, where none of those things are necessarily your real aim. So here are some other things, and I'm going to read out the personal reasons in a minute from the people who are here, but here are some other reasons. I think sometimes it's just the beautiful sound of the harp. We make, you know, the harp. The harp is a beautiful instrument, and I always find it particularly surprising when if I have any time off from playing so if I go away for a few days and I come home I play the harp and I play the first chord and I think wow and you just hear I feel I hear all the resonances differently again and I just get right back into just absolutely hearing the sound for its true beauty and that I think alone is a 
perfectly powerful and valid reason to want to play the harp. It's just, you know, the sound itself is beautiful. I love being personally surrounded by music as well. So something for me was I really wanted to learn to play to a certain level so I could play within an orchestra. And, you know, and I find that being in the middle of the sound of everyone else playing, the power, the, the different moods that it creates and all of that is incredibly inspiring. I love the fact that, um, you know, I can play and teach a group of people and we can all be part of sharing something. All of those things. I also that when we play for ourselves it can be very deeply engaging and it can push everything else out of your head so if you're you know having a very stressful time in your life or with your work or anything like that you you know playing the instrument and really really focusing and working on something that you love and that you're passionate about can just push I think everything everything else out of your head which can be so liberating I used to do a lot of scuba diving and the reason I loved that so much was you had to be really very, very focused for safety reasons, if nothing else. And I loved the fact that that meant that it just pushed everything else out of my mind. There was no time to worry about the next concert or whatever it might be. So those are all the reasons, uh, some of the reasons that I think we might want to play the instrument. Um, and then there were, I suppose there were just a couple more actually that I was going to share, which is things like um, some of us watch soaps or series or episodes of a programme that come up every week or, or once an, on a night, I have a guilty secret, I do watch a soap. And I, it's the last thing I do before I go to bed, I watch it on my phone, <laughs> when I've done all my other duties, all my, my working duties, my teaching duties, my parenting, um, my enjoying my parenting and all the things that are going on in my life. And then I just have this 25 minute window, which is just my headspace. And I think that, that playing an instrument offers us that as well. Um, and then there's the, the sort of academic side of it, isn't it? Like, you know, some of us like to do Sudoku puzzles, that's not for me, but you know, some people do. And Again, you know, decoding and working out how something works and how we're going to play it, I think also just can be really very, very good for our brains. So here um, are some of the reasons that other people want to play who have attended live. So I'm just going to read some of them out. Karen says, I wanted to learn the harp because I just love the sound, which is beautiful and forgiving. Yes, and Karen, you're absolutely right. And I think that, that one of the best things about the harp as well is that if you play a single note, it's beautiful for anyone you know you can do a, a workshop for a complete novice and the second they touch the harp if someone else has tuned it it will sound beautiful unlike some other instruments that can be really hard to make a note from for blowing purposes or embouchure or for you know bowing on a violin so yeah absolutely um, beautiful and forgiving yes i agree um for and then caroline says harp healing and prayers yes absolutely playing playing for for making for for creating backdrop to uh, words as well for prayers and things can be beautiful too and then Lorraine says, right now for myself, maybe also to write songs. So yes, that's a really beautiful aim as well. And yes, it's and you may find then you write songs and other people play them and that can also bring great joy too because you know that you've shared something for someone else. Um, I love Celtic ballads, says Joanne, and airs and I want to play them for myself and participate in the Celtic music group. Brilliant. And um, I'm going to come on to playing with groups in a minute for I think it helps, that can really help us with motivation. Susan says, I want to share my music with others, especially seniors in care homes. And that is hugely wonderful aim, Susan. Um, before I had my first daughter, I used to do, I worked a lot for a charity called Music and Hospitals. It's on the back burner at the moment. And it's, it's so powerful. Live music in care settings is just, you know, I think if we, if we all could do that one day a month, the world would be a better place. Uh, Kate says, I love to be able to accompany singing, but I also want to just play for my own enjoyment. The harp is wonderful accompanying singing. And one of the things I want to look at, everything's going to be slightly in brief today, but one of the things I want to look at is chords and inversions. It's going to be, as I say, very brief, but you know, you can, you can accompany a song as simply as playing your arpeggios, you know. <laughs> Playing, you know, simple chords and arpeggios, I'm not a singer, as you've all just heard, can be really beautiful and powerful. Cherry would like to use it for meditation, relaxation and connecting to nature. Yes, and actually taking your harp out into nature, which I know Cherry does, um, is one of the most wonderful things. Um, one of my favourite things that I've ever done was play to a field of cows. They all came to the gate and mooed and listened and <laughs> somehow this was quite magical. So if you ever get a chance to play to a field of cows, 
maybe make sure there's a gate there, but that can be really quite exciting too. Margie wants to be able to walk around and play your double string strapped, um, double string strapped on harp and not lose your place. Yes, so I actually play the um, DHC light electric harp on a harness, Margie, and you know that because we, we know each other a little, don't we? Through Deborah henson Conant, um, who also has a webinar this evening, by the way, I'll send you her link at the end of this. Um, and yes, walking around and playing the harp is a whole new thing, and I think it offers a very different feeling to playing the harp, and um, is, is really powerful. Marianne says, I want to improve to learn and arrange music. Yes, and arranging music is wonderful because then you can pick anything you want, whether it's been written for harp or not, and just get on with it and jump in. And so it's really, really great aim. Caroline says, you're a member of both the singing and the handbell choir at church, and you'd love to be able to play the harp with them as well. You've always loved the sound of the harp and really like to play, to play well. Yes, and playing, you know, with other people. I mentioned, you know, my joy of playing surrounded by other people's sound as well. And you have, you want to be at a certain point so that you can jump in and do that with others and so that's a wonderful wonderful aim too which says i love playing music at the bedside of people who are ill or for seniors in specialized care homes i want to play in a way that conveys comfort beauty and peace the heart can communicate the energy of vibrations that is actually healing yes absolutely and there's quite a lot of incredible studies that have been done um as well as the healing thing um healing side of it there's i even read a really fascinating article where um they have to use less pain relief for people if they have heart music would you believe and they're having Having operations and things so um yeah the harp is harp is hugely powerful um i mustn't digress too much but um one of the things that i remember very striking when i was um inexperienced going in and playing into care settings was i went and played for a lady and in her room uh because uh, she was too ill to come to the main uh, to, to a, i did a concert as well and then i went to bedsides and she wanted and um, they, they said oh you know she loves music she's loved music all her life and for some reason i chose to play her the waltz of the flowers with the with the harp could end at the beginning i don't think i can go into the right key fast enough um and i played it and she was very distressed and so i came to a quick stop i'm sure you all know the beginning of this the um um, it goes on and on and then you get into the main theme and i i came to a, a nice but quick stop and and i just paused and i remember taking a breath and thinking my harp needs to be in e flat major i put the harp into e flat major and i just did a very steady improvisation instead and she was peaceful, she was smiling, she was um, in a completely different place. And I don't know where that moment came from, but I just remember sitting there and kind of taking a breath and going, I need to be in this key and I need to do this. And so you're absolutely right, um, Richard. It's fascinating, isn't it? And, and wonderful, wonderful. So there are lots of reasons why you might want to play the harp. And I think we just covered some really, um, really important ones and there are of course an infinite number more reasons why you might want to to play the harp um so once we sort of you know if we think about those things we all have they'll, they will all have something we'll all have a reason and sometimes that reason might be quite hidden from yourself um or the true reason might be quite hidden from yourself but i'm not sure that that matters too much because the biggest thing is having the impulse and the desire to do it and it's sort of i'm not sure it really matters and, you know, don't if you because if, I'm saying this because I've had a student just come up in my Start Harp um, closed group and say that they don't feel that they have a particular reason. So I'm just saying this for you in particular, that I don't think that it actually has to matter because the reason might just be that you desire to play the instrument. You have an urge to go to the instrument and that is in itself a reason to play, isn't it? So, yeah. So also don't feel bad if none of these other reasons resonate with you. So then how do we make these things happen? How do we actually move forwards this year or any year or any time any place how do we help ourselves achieve these goals and that's kind of what I want to talk about really I mean the first thing of all is that we obviously need to find some time to practice really there you know we can all we'll all be able to play at a level we'll all have something that we can already do on our harp and getting deep into that and playing well at that level is very important but you will also um, want to practice if you want to um, progress in some way and that can be very very difficult 
Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes, and bearing in mind that playing the harp is my full-time job, I therefore it therefore blows my mind really how difficult it must be for some other people. But sometimes, you know, you feel like you could always be doing something else. There's always something that you should be doing, perhaps rather than playing. And for me, I think there's even sometimes an element, and I hope it's okay to say, but I sometimes even have an element of guilt. I think about spending time with my harp possibly because I love doing it so much, um, playing on it so much, but also just, you know, because I feel like, you know, oh, I should speak to so-and-so, or I should arrange that piece, or I should do this, or I should, um, I'd love to be with my daughter, or whatever it might be, or I should rest, <laughs> whatever it might be. Um, so I think, you know, we have to really sort of remind ourselves why we're doing it and allow ourselves that space, that precious time, so that we can give ourselves, even if it's only 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day, to really allow ourselves the space and time to be with our instrument. And I think that's, you know, the most important thing of all is to appreciate yourself and give yourself that time. And I'm saying this and thinking this is something I need to take on board really seriously too. Um, and the other things that I really Really think that um, help can help us move forward is the motivation of being within a group. Now, a few of you have mentioned things like that you are um, in choirs perhaps already. I know a couple of you who are here go to sessions, the music sessions, um, which is great because you go and play along while you know you take in your harp and someone strikes up a tune, and then you might play chords or something along, or you might take a tune and then everyone else will join in with you. It can be really great fun. Um, I as mentioned that I teach ensembles and playing with a harp ensemble can be really, really great. I was talking to my husband, who's um, a, a French horn player, not for his career, um, it's, his, it's his hobby, and saying, you know, what motivates you to play when I was thinking of putting this together and how do you, you know, happen? And one of the things that he said was that playing an orchestra and um he said that one of the things is that he doesn't want to you know he wants to be there and playing for playing well for everybody else as well as for himself so it is it's that feeling of, of wanting to be um you know to do your best for the group as well which takes away i think that self motive um feeling well that it's just for you and it becomes about others as well which i think many other things we can do with our playing can help you feel like that too and um, so and if that ever is a challenge for you then maybe that's that would be a good thing to do too regular lessons can be great of course because you know if you're turning up once a week to lessons face to face with somebody once a week is great because you know there's there's you don't feel there's that gap there's that space for you to go oh it's okay it's in two weeks time my lesson i'll start practicing for that tomorrow it'll be all right and then tomorrow becomes the next tomorrow and the next tomorrow and the next tomorrow sound familiar um so that's really a very good thing if you can do regular lessons you might think about doing online training there are quite a few different now online trainings out there the internet has really taken off and i think liberated lots of people who are isolated or couldn't find a teacher near them and things and that is also great and the nice thing i think about all the online courses is there tends to be a community element so certainly is with with start harp some of you who are here live are, have either taken or are in start harp at the moment and being part of the community actually i think is one of the most powerful things because it also helps you it motivates you by seeing other people's challenges and seeing that you're not alone in those challenges and so that can be very very helpful to help you progress is to share you know commiserate and uh, and share successes with others i think as you go along so how do i really think that you can progress or that anyone can progress the biggest thing of all that i find when i meet particularly adult learners I meet adult learners who are they have got to a certain level, maybe completely on their own, or maybe with their regular lessons, or maybe with attending, you know, a group workshop once every two months, or you know, when when a when a group gets together. And I find that often people are struggling to play with flow. So you know, people are very able to play a tune, but they may find that they pause and they don't go from bar to bar regularly or that they might find that they have nerves nervousness and which is another big thing so sometimes you know um obviously I, we can play something perfectly on our own and then you go to play it in that session or with that ensemble or in to accompany the choir whatever it might be and then suddenly your hands don't do what you want them to do 
and you might slip and make mistakes or things like that. And th so those are the things that I really meet. And I find that people get stuck at about, we have grades in, in the UK. I'm not sure what it's like around the rest of the world because we've got people from all over the world here. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and the, yeah, the, I think the um, idea of, well, for about, it's about grade three level. And I tend to see a lot of people sort of having got to where you've got an understanding, you can play some pieces, but actually taking yourself to the next level becomes really difficult. And the reason that I've seen time and time again for this, both when I've been teaching one to one and in ensembles and in drop in workshops, like um, travel around a bit doing workshops for other ensembles and things is really a uh, often a space in foundation knowledge and um, what do i mean by that there's a gap in knowledge either of technique or of play being able to improvise or of being able to play by ear so being able to listen to a piece of music and then pick it up and play it by ear or by reading music or, and, and included in reading music i think theory is a big part of that so these these four things i think are so so important being able to play with some technique, even if you only know some real basics, and I'm gonna go through those in a minute. Um, being able to read music. For some people, it, you don't have to be able to read music to be a musician at all. It's kind of completely irrelevant. But you may find then one day, somebody you really wanna play with says to you, oh, can you play this tune with me? And it's a tune you don't know, and they hand you it, and it's got chords, it might be a, a melody line and chords, and there'll be that moment where your heart longs to be able to do that and you can't. And I'm saying this from somebody who's had this experience because I learned to only read music. I couldn't improvise and I couldn't play by ear. And I used to sit when I used to hear session musicians playing, um, not so, sorry, sessions playing, not session musicians, but um, sessions in pubs and things like that. And I used to long to be part of it. And I used to think I can play these big fancy things but I can't go and play some chords with 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 this group and and be in the moment and and it used to really um it was a, it was a real problem for me and so you know so that however much you're not sure if you if all these four things don't resonate with you it is worth having a working knowledge of them and so if you if you uh the third the th third one that I was going to talk about is playing by ear Playing by ear is really, really great for so many reasons. Number one, if you hear a tune, you can work it out. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to buy the sheet music. Hooray. Um, it's also for a lot of people, it's their favorite way of playing. I think that there may be a couple of people I've taught here who it's their favorite way of playing. And I won't mention any names, but you're welcome to type into the window if you're, if you're happy to share that. Um, and playing by ear strengthens, I believe, your ability to play with flow and play when you're nervous and things like that, because if you can play by ear and you lose your place on a written sheet of music, then your ear will help you play the next few notes until you find your space. So again, even if you think you never want to play by ear, playing by ear will inform your playing of reading, playing written music. Then there's the improvising, which is again something that I never learned to do until relatively recently in my, my playing life. And I think that, again, not only is improvising wonderful for being able to play, to work in modes and to play just freely and to go into open spaces in nature and play and really just listen to what's going on around you and, and, and be at one with that. It also, again, I think helps if you're nervous or anything like that's going on and you're trying to play a piece. You, If you can improvise and you understand the chords and things that are going on, then you can improvise your way out of something and find yourself back to where you need to be. So I really feel that if you have a working knowledge, however much you may not necessarily want to use full time any of these four strands, well, I really think techniques underlying all of them, isn't it? It's the three strands, really. They all inform each other and they will all help you. So I do recommend for everyone to help you make your dreams happen, you know, and, and to be true to your heart this year, this week, this month, try all those different elements you know it's really going to help and on a, on a basic level it, it will it will just help you move forwards in all aspects of your playing i really really believe that there are no shortcuts is another thing that i really really believe that strong technique is one of the biggest things and i just want to first of all go through oh now want to go through five or maybe even ten i think things that i think that if you remember on technique level on a technique level they're going to help you with 
all these different things with all these different ways of playing i'm going to share my screen in a moment but i'm also going to send you a link now um so that you can download it for yourself it's a uh, basically a free download on my website it's called first step in harp technique now many of you here i don't know anyone's level um well i know some of you actually don't i've got any i don't know everyone's level though and certainly on the replay i don't even know who's coming and watching so you may you know be very advanced players and you may think i don't need to see this i think this is useful for all of us to have on our walls in our heart rooms to remind us of our techniques of the basic things we should be thinking about when we're playing so i've just sent you a link if you click on that link you should be taken to my website and be able to download the poster if you don't want to do that now that's absolutely fine i'll send you a link uh, when i send out the replay but i'm going to screen share now and hopefully you'll be able to see my screen actually at the top of this i give 10 things that i think are really really helpful to remember but i'm not going to go through those for now i want to look at these photographs of the hand you can see it perfectly hooray thank you lane lane welcome i don't think you were here at the start welcome so here's the biggest thing of all and i'm gonna we're gonna see exactly why in a minute when i go through a couple of the other things having a high thumb and low fingers is pretty much globally it seems the way it's played if you if you learn paraguayan technique it's quite different um and colombian harp playing but really most harpists will play with thumbs high and fingers down and if you remember that that it's so it's so foundational to everything you're going to find that you it will help you buzz less it will help you be more secure in your playing it will give you space when you turn and i'm going to talk about turns in a minute and that's one of the biggest reasons of all really 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 helpful and so those are two things thumbs up fingers down the third one that is the biggest one of all is elbow up in the left now some harp teachers also teach elbow up in the right and i think if you're playing on a lap harp so I'm not sure if you can still see me or not, actually. Um, if you're playing on a smaller harp, I personally find I have to have, for my lap harp, I have to have both my elbows up when I'm playing on my lap harp. But that will depend on your instrument and the height you're sitting and things like that. But yes, so elbow up in the left. Why? Another. This is another one that I think isn't obvious when you first start playing, but it's to help you when you move up and down your harp. If your elbow is up, then you're really kind of chilled and relaxed going up and down the instrument. Oh, and a funny key. Let me just change that key. Um, and it will really help you be free and easy with your movements. If your elbow's down, look what's happened. So I'm going to try and go up the heart. Can you see it gets really, really crunched up? Three. So three really simple things to remember. Thumbs up, fingers down, elbow up. Okay? When you've got your elbow up, be really careful with your posture. So this is the fourth thing I think that, well, I, I should have brought this one up first, is sitting. And in Start Heart, one of the first things that I give is a video that's 20 minutes long. You don't have to watch all of it. I give you different points for different size harps. But as how to sit comfortably at your instrument, because I met so many, I've taught so many people who have been learning on their own or whatever, and then come to me for lessons. And they're sitting with their shoulders tipped in and they're slouching down and the harps all the weights on their leg and all these things and i show them how to balance the harp so that it's weightless and how to hold shoulders so that you're completely relaxed how to play with for with minimal effort for greatest reward and um really this sitting position is really important so there we are we've got the sitting position being really important to make sure you're comfortable when you're playing if you're comfortable when you're playing you're going to want to play more it's going to be easy to practice you're not going to be sore if you're ever sore when you're playing stop investigate talk to people find out why thumbs up fingers down elbow up really really important so those are four things that i can share with you straight away and then the fifth thing i'm going to share with you there's a few more on this handout which you can download as i say is the spacing and the default fingering, okay? So on here, if you don't read music, I'll talk about it now, but um, it's a C and a D, the first two notes here, and it says above it, one and two, that's finger one and two. So if you see the interval of a second on music, try and play it with one and two. And an interval of a second, I mean one, two, neighboring notes is a second, okay? And then one and two on an interval of a third, one, two, three from C, D, E, that's a third there. Use one and two again. For the interval of a fourth, C, D, E, F, four strings, including the one you start on and the one you finish on. Again, one and two. And then moving to the fifth, one and three. You can read this for yourself if you read, but if not, I will just go through it. C and A, one and three. C and B, one and four. And octave, one and four. 
Why do I think that's so important? Well, because sometimes you meet them as a chord, those shapes. Sometimes you might meet them as a broken chord, or um, they're not really broken chord then, but neighboring notes. So you might go. I don't mean in one piece like that. That would be a very strange piece, wouldn't it? Although I'm sure a piece has been written like that. Um, anyway, I digress. So these notes, you know, these default fingerings will help you place, which is really the final thing that's most important of all, is learning how to prepare your fingers on the strings, place in advance, so that you are landed on those strings. And it feels the same every time you do it. If you can revert to this default fingering as much as possible, as soon as you have a rule, you break it, don't you? That's just one of those things. But if you can use this as the foundations for your choosing your fingering, then you start to find it's easy to do it with your eyes closed, okay? So there's one of the things that I talk about a lot in my teaching is practicing things, you know, doing maybe a row of fifths. With your eyes shut so that you get really used to how they feel under your hand because then it makes sight reading easier, it makes playing by ear easier, it makes improvising easier, you start to see the pattern. So those are really important. Um, do download this post, so there are a few other things on it, but those were the main sort of things I wanted to jump out to show you straight away. I need to motor on now, I know I do, because I also really want to go through three different techniques in brief as well. So I'm just gonna open up um, another window and I'm going to show you the turn. So this is another thing, again, as I say, to be true to your harp, I think these foundations in playing are often some of the missing links that we have, and they will really help you. I've actually chosen three very sort of theoretical, technical things to show you today, because I think that these are the biggest missing links that I see when I'm teaching. But that, you know, um, in Start Harp, we do cover an awful lot of, of improvising and playing by ear and, and more fun stuff. I realize I'm not sort of showing you the, the most fun side of, st of Start Heart right now, but that's not what today's really about. It's about trying to give you some things that you can implement straight away that are gonna help you. So on this one, it's, this is um, in Start Heart, we have foundation techniques. This is from level one, towards the end of level one. This is when we've learned to play with all four fingers because level one basically starts assuming no prior knowledge of the harp. And then it goes through playing by ear from the beginning improvising from the beginning, reading music from the beginning, technique from the beginning. So in introducing the turn, the reason I like to point out the turn to someone, if they've uh, if they've come to me and they've already been learning for a bit, but they maybe don't play with thumbs up and fingers down, is because playing a turn enables you to go up and down your harp continuously without letting go. I sometimes use the idea of talking about being a mountain climber and you wouldn't let go with your both arms and both legs at the same time unless you had a really secure hook, I suppose, at the top. But if you, uh, and we, so we try and place and hold on and things as much as possible. And the turn allows us to hang on to the harp, to be placed on the harp, even when we are doing more than four notes in a row. And this exercise here, if you, if you want to screenshot it, that's absolutely fine for those of you who know how to do that um, on your computers. This isn't part of a handout or anything that I'm giving out today, but it's it's a broken, it's showing you how to turn in a broken, in, and I've broken it up. But here's what I just want to share with you quickly. The very first line is going from C to F to G to F. And then it does again, C, F, G, F, C. It's a skeleton of a scale of what you would do for a scale the bottom half of a scale with the turn in. And here's what the turn is. The turn is actually where your fingers are going underneath, isn't it? It's going, my finger is going underneath the thumb like that. Okay, so actually I believe in the video for this that I start even more simply and I have the thumb resting on the F and we just go C to G, C to G. And can you see how big the space is between the thumb and the four? Now, I'm not telling you that I always do that when I'm playing. I know I don't, okay? But when I'm practicing it as a technique, I'm trying to make sure that I'm bending from the second joint and that I am doing that big space because it allows me space to turn underneath. Here are the, here are the things I often see. People playing more like this and then trying to turn underneath. And can you see how difficult that then is? Because there's nowhere for the thumb to go. It's easy to buzz, it's easy to slip. Um, I also even see this, where it's the other way up, 
and then people end up with bunny ears as I call them <laughs> so these two fingers here now what's the matter with that well it could be fine you might find that you managed to play those notes all right but look I had to move them from right up here and then I had to bring them down to carry on playing if you can just remember this idea of of having your fingers down and your thumb high and the ones you're not using resting just hanging out resting near to the palm of your hand not hold don't hold them in tight because you want to keep chilled and relaxed and make sure everything's soft and as supple as possible so you're not hurting yourself but these two fingers if you can keep them down look what happens if i then do the full scale they're just there they can just go on the string rather than as i just showed you if you do this and you have to start doing things like this and to remember the turn, here is the way that I teach it. Imagine that when you're swinging on your thumb with the pivot, because the thumb will be the pivot for doing an underneath turn, think of it like, I, I think of it like drawing a giant smile, <laughs> okay? So can you see that looks a bit like a giant smile? And I think that's a really helpful thing to think. And we never do such a bit, you're not going to go like this to do your turn. But if you remember it as being a motion in that way, then I think it really helps you remember that that's that's the aim you know low and underneath will help you do that you can also think of it being like a pendulum in a grandfather's clock okay and then if you're coming down when we turn the thumb comes over the top doesn't it okay i'm showing you this in a scale it could obviously happen in the pieces all the time so how do i remember that i think of it like drawing a rainbow okay so the thumb is going to arch over and land on the next note you're going to so that, that was what I wanted to share with you about the turn. There's an awful lot more, obviously, in this in the in the video in this course. But if you remember your thumbs up and fingers down, as I mentioned, that's on the start harp technique video. And then you think of you try and remind yourself that you're thinking of a smile or a rainbow. And then I think that those foundations will stand you in really good stead. And then when you're turning in your pieces, you will be more secure. You're going to be less likely to slip off the strings. You're going to be less likely to buzz. Win, win, win. Right. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. So the next thing I wanted to show you, very, very briefly, because I can't possibly do all this now, um, I wanted to talk about chords and inversions um, very, very briefly. And then I realised that I wanted to talk to you about great length about them and be much more useful, but I haven't got time, so I'm going to talk to you very briefly. So in the online courses that I offer in Start Harp and in all my workshop teaching and things like that, I will sometimes cover chords. And chords you might see written on some music, you'll see them written above. So can you see on this little row of music here, you've got C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, B diminished, and C. So if I play them for you, you've got a major chord, minor chord, minor chord, major chord, major chord, minor chord, diminished, and major. And I've just played those to you all in a root position, okay? I haven't got time to go into to explain any more than that. But what I this, there's something really important I just want to share that I think you can use right now or at least see why it can be helpful right now. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly say, if you haven't ever played a chord, because there might be someone here who's never played a chord, I don't believe it really, but just in case. If you started on C, use your finger three. Think of it as a play one, miss one, play one, miss one, play one shape using three two and one c miss the d place on the e miss the f place on the g so that's three on the c the red string two on the e one below the blue or black string depending on your type of strings and then thumb on the g one above okay so you've got the triad then and that is what you call a root position chord and this shape if you look at these these are all in root position shape here is something that i really wanted you to to know they're helpful for improvising with they're helpful when you're playing by ear but when you're reading music they're also very helpful because if you see something that has that goes on all the spaces can you see the d minor chord there is at the bottom of the, the mute stave isn't it so and then it's on a space and a space and then the e minor chords line 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 if you see something that looks like that shape then it's this shape on the harp so if you visually see that shape the way that it looks there as a root position you can learn to just know that that's what you can grab and have the shape of on your harp okay so you start if you can memorize the shape of a root position and a first position and a second inversion chord then you will, if you can visually recognize them on sheet music, written out music, you don't have to read the notes anymore. You're, you're completely freed from going, okay, that's an E and a G and a B, and then having to learn that. You can just go, 
okay, it's got an E at the bottom and it's a first investment shape, or, a, a, sorry, that was a reach, but whatever it might be. And let me just show you, and there's another session, this, these are all in level two, where I go through, I remember really working hard on how I was going to teach this. I think I do it with post-it notes and a big whiteboard and things. Um, the root first inversion and second inversion is shown here. So for those of you that aren't sure what, about what that means, if you are playing in C ma a C major triad, which is just what we did in root C and then E and then G, for the different inversions, we just, all it is, it sounds so fancy. It's like, oh, could you play a first inversion C chord? It's not that important or clever at all. I think there's a lot, always sometimes a lot of mystery around these things. All you're doing is just swapping the order of the notes. It's really not clever. We're just taking the C off the bottom and plonking it on top. Okay, and you can see that in the hopefully in the way that this is written out here. I've tried to show you them. Um, the way that they go up the page is deliberate. Look, the E's are level, the G's are level, and the C, then the top C's are level. We've taken that C off the root and we've plonked it on top. Okay, it's really easy to get muddled about how, how to call these. So think of the root like the root of the tree, and then think you're starting on the first step up. So now if I'm doing a first inversion C, I'm not starting on the C, I'm starting on the first step up of the ladder. If you now think of it like a little mini ladder, and you're in a first inversion, you've plonked that C on top. And then the second inversion, you have shifted the, the now you're going to put the, the lowest note, which was the E, you're going to plonk it on top and you get your second inversion shape. Still using C, E, and G, but we've changed the order. We're now doing G, C, and E. They all have the same underlying harmony. That They're all the same chord, but they have a different feel to them. And they can, they can be really useful if you're composing, for those of you thinking of composing, those of you who want to do therapy work, those of you who want to um, play um, in session musician stuff and all that kind of thing. These are all really useful for just changing kind of the, the feel of something. And they have other uses too for fast and close position playing as well. Um, the three chord trick, which I talk about quite a bit in, in one of the videos as well. But they are really useful. And I, so I encourage you, even if you take away nothing else from this webinar, to go and investigate inversion chords and work on them and listen to their sound. And then each of the chords that I showed you on the previous page, this one here, can be reordered. So if I did it on the D minor chord, actually that's the beginning of a, of, of a really famous world piece, isn't it? Um, anyway, um, I'm not going to digress because I could digress for hours. So there we are. So those are some inversions. And if I then just show you them written out, here's the, here's the final, this is the final thing I really wanted to share about inversions. Again, when it comes to reading sheet music written down, if you can memorize, and there's only three shapes to memorize for this particular triad shape there are more but you know there's always more we can do isn't there there's always another step but for these the way that I've just talked about it there are only three shapes to memorize there's the one that goes on all the lines all the spaces the root shape that we talked about a moment ago then there's the first inversion shape look it has two close together and then a bit of a space and another note and then the second inversion has one on its own and two close together if you want to be fancy about it, that's the first inversion has the interval of a third and then the interval of a fourth. And I briefly mentioned about those earlier. If you've not ever come across things being spoken about like that, then you can replay the video and, and watch that again, hopefully. And then the second inversion is an interval of a fourth and then a third. If you can visually recognize those three things, I literally think it's worth having on a flashcard and going over and over them. Then when you see them in music and they come up again and again in your left hand and in your right hand, you know, sometimes you get a melody. Where there's, you know, I just played a made up melody then, didn't know what I was going to play, always fun. Um, but, you know, I used inversion shapes all the way through there. I snuck in one slightly different shape by accident, well, not by accident, but because it fits. Um, there are, yeah, um, it sounds lovely, doesn't it? But if I was reading that on the sheet music, I might have to spend ages going, right, okay, I need a C, and then I need a G. But if I could just recognize those three shapes, I could go, root, second, first, second, root, you know, and just be able to play them like that. And I really, it's something I go on and on about, particularly with my ensemble members, I think this one, is that if you can just know these inversions, it really liberates you so much when you're sight reading from feeling bogged down in loads of notes, because they're just, 
there when you know them like this it's really interesting i think we all have different superpowers in our playing everyone i meet has a superpower when they're playing you've, you've got one every single one of you um if i could sit and hear you play then i'd be able to i i'd hope you find your superpower i'm sure but um i've always found that reading block chords okay and i think it's because i got into reading these inversion shapes quite early on whereas rhythmic rhythms took me a lot longer and but i meet a lot of people who are far happier reading a string of notes and complex rhythm um then they are reading you know an eight note chord so rather than this way rather than going um vertically it's um lots of people prefer to read horizontally and we you know we have to find out our superpower and be pleased with that and then we also have to work on the things that we want to work on so yeah great okay so that's that one the final thing i wanted to show you technique wise um this in particular i wanted to show you this because I think so often when we hear the harp played, there are several things that we want to do, I think, when we first learn the harp. One of them is to play glissandos, which are amazing. One of them is to play really fancy glissandos. Um, my favourite one on this lever harp that I can get is, is this one. Um, the pentatonic glissando, which is just so almightily wonderful. Um, but I think another thing that we often want to be able to do is to play arpeggiated chords or rolled chords or spread chords. What do I mean by those? Well, I think either that's a rolled chord or a spread chord, and sometimes you might play them fast, or you might play them very luxuriously. And I played a descending one last there, and then just playing the normal arpeggios is playing them as broken chords in my head. So this is really quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, how I think is the best way to practice a rolled chord. You can do this um, even with, you know, if you could just do it with three fingers on back on that um, triad we just learned. But I'm just going to show you very quickly, there's a big video about this here, but I'm not going to do it, um, I can't do it in depth, but it's, it's hopefully will give you something, I think it's a really fast, well, not fast, it's a really something I can show you fast that you can work on that will hopefully give you um, improve your rolled chords. If you put your fingers on already to do one, I'm going to be doing it on C, E, G, C, E, G, C, E. So I'm going to be working on a C chord with all eight fingers, okay? I've got my thumb up, I've got my fingers down, I've got my elbow up, I'm going to sit relaxing comfortably. All those things are my foundation techniques, I'm not going to forget those in this process. But... Here's what I'm going to do, simple as this. I'm going to play the bass note four times. That helps me memorize the feeling. I can think about how it feels under my hand. It helps me learn to place well and without buzzing. If I really think about what I'm doing and it allows me to think about my technique and how relaxed I am. Then I play the bottom two notes four times. It teaches me all the same things, okay? Um, so it's teaching me about that space, the way it feels, the way it sounds. Bottom three, four times. And I'm playing them as fast as I'm comfortable with. I'm rushing it because of the time, but you could do it much slower in a way that you can play evenly with control. And then the four, bottom four. Then the bottom five. Sometimes I get students say one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 And then try it as your roll. Okay, I've done that really fast to give you the idea and you can go away and try it. But basically, that keeping having to go back on the strings helps you memorize the shape of the chord, memorize the feel of the chord, helps you work on your placing, allows you the space to play with a good technique. So play it slowly for your ability right now. If four note chords are too much, try it on three note chords. And you can do it in reverse as well. You know, if it was an upside down one, then you just do it the other way. It really will work. I've seen this time and time again and seen people very, very pleased with their results. So that's a definite one that I think you can go away with and try and put into your practice that should help. Great. Okay, I think that brings me to the end of all the things I was hoping to talk to you technique-wise about. Yes. So I'm just going to stop my screen share now. There we are. Hello. <laughs> 
fantastic. So I that was pretty intense. I hope you're all okay. Oh, Cherry says, smiles and rainbows, who couldn't love the heart? Exactly, I completely I couldn't agree more. <laughs> okay, so um, really to round off the session, because I have like three minutes left, we did start a little bit late, so I can go a little smidge longer perhaps. If you have to leave, I won't be offended. Um, we can really, um, you know, I think we can really help ourselves by by finding either people to play with that will inspire us, some form of study that will help us move forwards, and by really working on this rounded approach and um, allowing ourselves to experiment in different different genres of music as well, even if we have something very specific in mind, the, the a rounded approach with a really good underlying fundamental understanding of technique and of theory, playing by ear, improvising, reading music is gonna really, really help you even if your path, your chosen path is very specific, they all inform each other. They really, really, really do. I would love for you to download the Start Heart poster and do it on your wall. And if you are a teacher who have come in to see me today, thank you for coming and watching, but you might find that you um, might want to share this with your students, you're most welcome to. Um, that, so the Start Heart poster, I will see if I can just share that. Yep, there we are again. So if you haven't had that link, copy that link. I'll, I can also send it out. I'll send it out in the replay for you as well. Um, I would also, of course, if you won't, if you'll forgive me, just love to say that, you know, I'd love to teach you in Start Harp. So the, the idea with Start Harp really was born out of the fact that I met so many people who told me they'd always wanted to play the harp and they hadn't been able to find a teacher or they couldn't access lessons because they live remotely away, in, you know, in the high hills somewhere or other, or, or they um, are looking after someone at home and they need to be at home. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm just about to have my, well, I'm having my, my, my second child is arriving in at the end of April or early May. And so, you know, I, I'm, you know, can't, uh, if I was studying the harp as an extra thing to my job, then I would obviously want to find a way of not having to be away from home so much um, for that. Um, then, you know, there, I also wanted to have that community feeling and I never expected it to be so strong, but it's very powerful. This group, the, we have a closed Facebook group and then we talk to each other within the class as well. And we have live chats, in fact, we've got one later tonight as well. And we, it's just somehow the support of everyone else and seeing other people who are working through the same material as you is just very, very powerful. And that's something that I think I'd never experienced a bit with my ensemble teaching, but not with my one-to-one -one teaching, because one-to-one -one teaching, you know, it was always one student coming in um, and they were on their own and having it one-to-one, uh, -one, therefore not, not, not the same as the next person, if you know what I mean. Um, and there's something very powerful about being on exactly the same path as other people. And so, uh, you know, I think that the fact that, well, and, and the final thing about Start Heart that I was really passionate about was making it fit on a little heart to make it inexpensive, because that was the biggest thing of all, was that people were telling me that obviously, you know, that a heart like this, you're lucky if you can find something that's a thousand pounds, that's I'm talking in UK money now. Um, at, at the very least for a, a playable sort of lever harp that isn't going to explode on you. Um, whereas actually to get a lap harp without any levers on it, you can find them for, for only about, you know, 150, 200 pounds. They, I assure you that if you get the harp bug, you will not want to stay on an instrument like that. You'll, you'll find that you'll end up on something different, but um, as in you'll want levers probably, and you might want more strings. Um, or you might want a better quality lap harp. Playing a lap harp is a beautiful, wonderful thing. All I mean is, is that if you get a really expensive one, you might, you, you'll probably find, I think I haven't had a single person that started on one like that and hasn't gone on to something slightly different, but it allowed, um, start harp level one and two work on just two uh, 17 string harps. So you can get a harp that will, um, that won't break the bank. Um, and that was another big passion for it. So, it's an intensive course as well. Um, and I think I'm always blown away by uh, time and time again being told that it surpasses people's expectations. And I just, uh, it's 
the the proudest thing that I've created in my life. So I'd love to help because people are, um, I'm helping. I think people um, progress and be true to their heart and and help to move forwards in a way that I can't even do num one to one because there's I'd have to see students for like three or four hours a week to be able to <laughs> deliver the same sort of content. So I would love you to um, download the poster. If you're not already connected to me on Facebook, come and join me on Facebook because then uh, you'll hear about other free webinars anyway. Um, do sign up, sign up for Start Harp if you can. I'll put some links in in a minute. And finally, um, Deborah Henson Conant is about um, is going to run a free webinar tonight as well, and she has a wonderful online court, um, training, huge, vast training platform called the Hip Hop Academy. And in fact, um, Start Harp originated as a book and it was in the discussion with Deborah, Deborah and after I took some of her online courses that I was really inspired to make Start Harp as an online course and it slots into her um, she, we're calling it sort of it's like a sister program in a way because I kind of teach these foundations and Deborah teaches a lot of other wonderful styles and um, inspiration and all sorts of things. She's an incredible lady to work with. So go and go and do her free webinar too. So I'll put those links in in a moment. I'm going to read out these messages before I finish tonight. Um, Lane says, Startup is an amazing program for all the reasons you stated, Shelley. Thank you for sharing your passion with all of us. You're such a blessing to those of us wanting to play the harp. Bless you, Lane. Thank you very much. Lane, I miss you because Lane has flown the nest, really. You've done you've done level three and 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 sort of you, you come back in though and it's lovely to have you in the group, in the... Um, closed group as well so Karen says oh hang on uh, Cherry says wonderful to see you again Shelley missed you guys happy magical musical new year to all lovely to see you Cherry really lovely welcome um and Karen says I can certainly vouch for your startup courses that has greatly exceeded my expectations thank you Karen I'm so happy to hear that and I hope you continue enjoying it just for those of you who have made it to the end I should just say um thank you personally to you all so Thank you very much, Caroline, for coming. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for coming. Thank you very much, Cherry, for coming. Thank you very much, Jill, for coming. Thank you so much, Ivan, Ivan for coming. Thank you so much, Joanne, for coming. Julie V for coming. Karen Berry, thank you very much, Karen. Karen Nelson, very much for coming. Kate, thank you for coming. Lane, thank you for coming. Lorraine, thank you for coming. Lorraine, I should have said Lorraine Fulmer and Lorraine Hawkins. Margie, thank you for coming. Marianne, thank you for coming. Marion, thank you for coming. Peggy, thank you very much much for coming for Lenore thank you very much for coming Richard thank you for coming Sandra thank you for coming Susan thank you for coming and for all of you watching the free play thank you so much for coming but thank you so much everybody and um, most importantly of all enjoy your heart be true to your heart follow your passion make space for yourself and your instrument whatever it is you do if you can just find those 10 minutes a day to be with your heart you will progress and you and and even if you don't want to progress you just have that amazing time with your instrument so thank you everyone